Hello and welcome to Inside COP15. We're coming to you live from our studio in Copenhagen. Every day we'll be bringing you the news and views from people on the ground at the summit. Today I'm joined by Director General of WWF Jim Leap, John Vidal, Environment Editor for The Guardian, and Stephen Briggs, a Senior Scientist at the European Space Agency. So, first of all, Jim, you're obviously here with WWF. Yes. It's very early stages in the conference, obviously, but how do you think things are going from WWF's perspective so far? Well, I think we come into this conference with actually high hopes that countries are finally ready to come together in a global deal, a global response to climate change. And, and the developments of the last several weeks, where you see major players beginning to put real commitments on the table, give it the possibility of success at the end of this conference. Excellent. Um, you know, speaking of, we hope for success, obviously, but it all depends on what sort of success it's going to be. Yes. And Barrasso obviously made a statement yesterday that he didn't think a legally binding agreement was going to happen. And there's a lot of the big players have, have said the same thing. Do you think that it's possible? It's obviously what the NGOs are pushing for, but is, is it possible? Well, the short answer is yes, it's entirely possible. And what you've seen happen over the last couple of months is, is a variety of players trying to manage expectations with this conference. But the fact is that one of the things that's most important is that when the heads of state, and we'll have more than 100 of them here next week, when the heads of state go home, they go home prepared to act on their commitments. And to do that, they have to be confident that their peers will do the same, that other countries will also fulfill the commitments they've made. And the best way to get to that level of confidence is to make sure that we come away from this conference with legally binding commitments. And why? I mean, they've had two years to prepare for this, obviously, since Bali. Why do you think people are still saying it's not going to happen, it's not going to happen? What's holding people back? Well, of course, I mean, the best thing would, is to manage expectations down so whatever does happen sounds like good news, right? So yeah. that's not surprising in a way. Uh, and maybe it's not surprising that for two years we you saw countries hiding behind each other, sort of holding back to see who would move first. But now they're all moving, and that means that over this two weeks we really can get to a deal, and that's the momentum we have to build on. Do you think that NGOs, I mean, all the NGOs are obviously really hoping for a legal agreement. Are NGOs simplifying it? Is it more complicated than, you know, than sitting down in a room and sorting this out? There's obviously extensive talks that have to go on. Are NGOs making it more simple than it is, do you think? No, no, it, I mean, of course it's complicated, right? This is probably the most daunting challenge we've ever faced as a world community. And the yeah. first time we faced a challenge that really requires everybody to be part of the solution. But then there's been 20 years of work now, right, in getting to this global response, and absolutely countries can come together on a solution by the end of this two weeks. Okay, thank you very much. So moving on to you, John, you're obviously sort of <coughs> on the ground, media. Um, there's 30,000 people here, you've got extensive amounts of stories. How are you deciding what to focus on? You know, who are you working yeah. with and how are you deciding where your focus lies? Well, it's a complete nightmare, frankly. Um, on a meta scale, um, there's three and a half thousand, five thousand journalists here, all looking for the story, and no one knows what the story is, because the whole thing about these talks is they're totally opaque. Everyone tells you lies. Nobody actually knows what's going on. Not allowed in anywhere. Um, so you have to put your ear to the ground, listen to different people, talk to colleagues, and different things. Out of it, uh, the extraordinary thing is that every day a story does emerge. So you get some little stories in the background science story or whatever but the big political story emerges about four or five o'clock and today was a, yesterday we had a bombshell I mean we literally we the Guardian happily um, got a got a leak from uh, rather dramatically from a country that I cannot say <laughs> and, uh, um, and, uh, and it's kind of put a bomb underneath the whole conference because it's brought right up to the front the simmering resentment and distrust um, and uh, between some of the rich countries and the poor. Um, and uh, and it's, it's fundamentally, it gets right to the heart of the, of, of the problem we've got, which is the poor countries are saying, we don't trust you. You know, you, 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 you're, you're not going to come up with a legal agreement. There's no way in that time. It's absolutely impossible. The best you can do is maybe a year. When has a political agreement ever been held by any world head of state? It never has. Um, the money you're offering is peanuts. The... Uh, uh, the temperature which you're trying to hold uh, the, the global temperature to is clearly a sort of suicide pact for Africa or other countries. This is basically a deal for the devil. Um, and it's anyway, so that, that has brought that all out into the open. Um, so and you think, lot, I mean, yeah, just interrupt, do you think it was the right decision to bring all that into the open? You yeah, see absolutely. Whole new dynamic absolutely, new... absolutely. It's, I mean, the role of the press here is terribly, terribly important. In the past, these cop things have been rather cosy little chummy things between rich countries, media, and 
uh, and the heads of state or, or, or ministers and whatever, and each country delegation briefs its own journalists. So what you read in England is one thing, what you read in Bangladesh is something else. But the reality is that the developing countries never, ever got a say. I mean, really, did not. you never knew these things were going on. Um, and uh, for the first time now, there may be three, four, five hundred journalists from developing countries. And they're adding an enormous sort of impact to the thing because they're very close to the delegation. They're telling us from the rich countries what's going on in their delegation. And what we're finding out is all split. I mean, governments are split, delegations are split. Um, the and whole thing is a complete mess. Yeah, are split now, absolutely. Because China's on, on the other you know, yeah, yeah, saying yeah, yeah. actually they don't want. To. And so it's you know, the talks are absolutely clearly on a knife edge. And there's no way, if anyone tells you that they know which way it's going to go, they don't. They're lying. It's, they can't so, do it. No, no, yeah. So I think there are a couple of important points here. And let me just pick up a couple. Uh, one is, I mean, it is about confidence, mm. right? And this goes back a little bit to what I was saying before, yeah. is that countries have to have confidence in each other, confidence mm. that, in fact, commitments will be delivered. Mm. Whether it's the commitment of the European Union to reduce its emissions or the mm. commitment of the United States to be part of a finance mm. package mm. or the commitment of China mm. to slow the growth in its emissions. Mm. But I think that's quite important and you're right that, to put a spotlight on that. Secondly, I think it's important to recognize that for everybody there's a huge interest in getting a deal here because it is the best political opportunity we have ever had. To but get yeah, a deal. But, yeah, going on. Right? No, 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 right? <laughs> so it has to be, I mean, we have to push hard for a good deal. Yeah. But there's huge value in getting a deal here. And if these talks were to collapse, it's anyone's guess when we get such an opportunity again. So there's a huge pressure, I think, it should be at least, to really find a way to build that confidence. Yeah. But, it's, but, but, but it's a bit like when, you know, when the elephants start moving, then the little guys get hurt. And that's what's going to happen. We're seeing that already, is that these huge elephants, America, China, wherever, are sort of trampling around. And the small countries, the OSIS countries, the uh, developing countries, the, the poorest countries, are... And they know they're going to get muscled okay. out. Of but this. let's be clear: if the um, elephants don't move, then the little guys also get hurt. But the danger is, what do you have? Is something like well, the World Trade Talks or wherever, where everyone comes out with agreement, so all the world leaders come in and they will yeah. sign up to something, and then they go home and they realize, oh, well, we just sign, we can't sign up to this, I just and so it ends up yeah. as a complete <laughs> total mess. It's like yeah. get it right now, you know, respect the United Nations, as, as opposed to just sort of barging through all these agreements, and uh, I, then it will work. But uh, I'm. No, I just want to bring Stephen into the conversation because we're obviously discussing here the media and the talks that are going on. Stephen's actually on the practical side of this. You know, you're actually on the practical side, finding out what's going on with climate change, what the damage to the earth is, um, and the human impact. I mean, can you tell us a bit about what you're doing with with the satellite technology to really find out what effect climate change is having? Well, really, I think there are two different aspects to it. One is the so-called essential climate variables. These are the variables which model us and, uh, and uh, those who are trying to predict what climate is going to do in the future need to have uh, routine measurements of these over long periods of time. And satellites, uh, there are some 44 of these items which have been defined by the Global Climate Observing System, things like soil moisture, upper atmospheric temperature, uh, ocean biology, and so on. Fundamental parameters which describe how the Earth works as a system. And of these 44, about 28 are more or less dependent upon satellite data for their provision. And so there's a very important role for satellite agencies to be able to provide the data which are needed in order to understand what's happening, not to make any policies about it or to predict, but to just to begin to understand what we're doing and to see what is actually happening. Then the second side of it is, uh, is what the consequences of any change might be and how are we going to manage those consequences or mitigate the consequences, adapt to them, or even attribute where they're coming from. And there, there's uh, the two aspects of the problem are quite different because one understands the prediction and the modeling is essentially global activity. The impacts can be quite local. And so if we look, for example, we, uh, there are many examples I could quote, but uh, one of the technologies we have allows one to be able to measure small displacements in the Earth's surface by imaging from space with a particular technique. And that's used in Netherlands to monitor small disturbances in the levels of dikes. And so as sea level rises, we have a mechanism to be able to look at small changes of millimeters a year uh, all the way across the entire dike system of the Netherlands. So that's on the output side, if you like, things which you can measure and understand and monitor from space as a consequence of change, uh, as well as the fundamental information which you get to be able to model and predict change. 